Magnus Lindberg, it's a great pleasure to receive you in the, uh, here in Metropolitana. You just came from a rehearsal to the next Sunday concert. Um, you, this season, you are the, the guest composer of, of the house. We just we already heard the cello concerto in the beginning with Pavel Komziakov. It was a, a wonderful concert. Uh, and now we will hear Corale and the, the, the clarinet concerto. Uh, but this time you are going to be a musical director. Uh, the first question is, uh, is difficult for you to get the, the necessary distance to, from your works when you are directing an orchestra with your own works? Yeah, that's, it's a beautiful question because evidently my, my life is about composing. But I was always also involved with performing music, so I, my education was the, the, the piano, but already in the 1970s, when I studied music at the Sibelius Academy in Finland, I spent every Saturday during the season with the conductor class, mm -hmm. and those were the great years of uh, Jorma Panula, who became famous for his conducting class, and we had the luxury of having uh, Arvid Janssons, the professor of, comp of conducting from Leningrad, Arvid Janssons, today people more know Maris Janssons. Maris Janssons is the son yes. of Arvid. He came with a huge tradition of, of conducting and I grew up with always working with those conductors and, and playing for them. And even if I never did the conducting class, it has always been part of my collaboration with music. So, so the time I've spent together with my friends, colleagues, being conductors and speaking about all this. Over the years, I uh, decided that a limited amount of projects where you are also involved mm -hmm. with not only the conceptual part of making music, which is to write scores for players, you also are involved with putting things together. For me, that has been a journey which is so mutual in both directions to learn what composition is about and to see how things work and in a way to get to eat your own medicine, so to say, when you have to put uh, your own music into action. Yes, I think, to. yeah. So I think that is uh, very healthy. There is no illusion of going into the real business of conducting. We have fantastic conductors in, in the world and they, they make the big thing. Yet, I think from the point of view of musicians, it is interesting and there is long history with this. There is interesting point when the author, when the composer conducts his or her own music because and for us it's it a comes very good a, yeah it comes a different there is a different uh, yeah, you show us yes to yeah this we have we have uh, models in the past of course the great conductors like Mahler Richard Strauss they were they were yeah. uh, maestros of, of Toscanini we shouldn't forget though that the, in those days with Toscanini and Furtwängler and all these they all composed so it was not it was not the maestro thing started with uh, of course it started with Toscanini and before but Karajan sort of made made okay. the conductor not attached anymore to to composition but but it's it's a great pleasure and and I I feel I can give something to the musicians which is different from from their ordinary week with a great conductor mm -hmm. or or a musician so that's that's why I like to to take that uh, that uh, role so, also. Let's talk briefly uh, about the, the the works you are going to to interpret. Uh, we are going to begin with Corale. It's a small prelude, orchestral prelude. And I heard, I read uh, somewhere that um, you made uh, an analogy uh, with the fall and rise of the tide when uh, um, a propose of of this uh, this composition, Corale. Can you explain briefly your idea with that um, analogy? Or? Yes, this piece is based on the famous Essis Genug chorale by Bach. 
fortunately, he didn't compose the chorale, he only harmonized it. The chorale was uh, uh, written Arabian. before, yeah. yes, as was the case with many of his, uh, his chorales, they were piece, pieces that existed. So I didn't feel touching Bach, which is, of course, a scary thing to do. But, but for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to see how my own musical language in those years, this was uh, 2001, 2002, when I wrote the piece, to see how my own harmonic language would cope with a tonal structure underneath. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made a lot of research how to use the chorale, the theme, melody of the chorale, some of its harmonic uh, solutions, and how to make them organically fill into my own quite thick harmonies, always spreading out in, in big registers, etc. And it started to feel like, like uh, as you say, the, the tidal waters where there are, uh, with low water, you can see the bottom of the sea, the rocks, etc. And then the water comes in and then it's embedded, but you know that the rocks are there. Okay. So I think this uh, analogy of something where this chorale is underneath basically all the time, it comes up to the surface and towards the end of the piece it becomes very obvious that the chorale is there and I go, I go all the way into the original harmonic setting, never note by note. It's a, it's a beautiful idea. Yeah. Uh, and um, the, the clarinet, the concert for clarinet, it's also from 2002. Um, you wrote it for uh, Cari Crico, with, with a close collaboration with the, with the performer. Um, I noticed also that you wrote the, the cello concerto for another um, cellist to work with you, very Hans Kartunen. Yes. Um, and yesterday, in the end of the rehearsal here, I noticed that you went to work with Nuno Silva alone. So I, I just want to ask you, what kind of role you want to trust to the performer on your compositions? These pieces are written for uh, musicians to be played and of course the concerto as a genre is the perfect thing to do. Many composers, even of my generation, but especially one generation before, they were afraid of the concerto. We had a time in the 1960s, uh, 70s, when concerto was sort of politically incorrect, where, where the, the the solo tutti was felt uncomfortable and many composers in those years wrote great music but went for an anti-concerto writing where the soloist is not anymore the sort of central point but rather a conceptual thing which is fine i'm not against that and i i, I historically very well understand from where it came for me, that was not a problem. For me, a concerto is very much about a concentration into one or a couple of instruments, if it's for more than one soloist. And then the dialogue with an orchestra, and of course, a dialogue for the composer with his or her interpret. So with Kari Kriku and with Ansi Kartunen, I spent months working, working, working with collaborating you. with them and especially with Kari Kriku. He is and was hysterical about details and trimming things. And when you can work with players of that level, they try to sort out all complicated things. And if they find a solution where two notes can change order or something, which just opens up all of a sudden a passage that is almost impossible, or impossible, just with a small shift, it's different. becomes something. I think that is important in a concerto, because a concerto should be a piece with uh, virtuosity, and it, it's also, we shouldn't forget that when you play a concerto, it's normally in a big hall. So the projection of sound, it's not like in chamber music, where you sit in intimate uh, connection to the instruments, you should have the soloist communicating with the last row in the hall and it's sometimes very far away. So somehow the solo 
has of course to be virtuoso, that I definitely want, but it has also to be somehow natural. So, so I think that for a composer it's a very healthy thing to write a concerto because it really it sharpens your way of, of writing for instruments. Not about uh, compromise, it's not a question about doing things only easy for the reason of easy, but it's a thing to do them uh, smooth so that the soloist then can, uh, can project. I have a funny story to tell about this concerto, which took me then many more months to write than I would have thought. I mean, I spent a full winter, so we can speak about a year with the, with the, with the project. But I had written a great length of music already, and we had spoken with uh, Kari about the piece, and he had come with some ideas of how it should be with full orchestra and loud music, all aspects of clarinet and so. So the first time I present music for him, and I had written many pieces for him before, 91 I wrote a big clarinet quintet for him, and, and uh, we, we started to work together already in the late 70s, early 80s with Toimi, so I knew, I knew him, of course. But I came with the first drafts of music of the concerto, and he played and he didn't look very happy. And, and um, so, sort of fell away, and everything was difficult. And then we left it. A couple of days later, he comes back to me, and he plays it again. And he was very happy and, and looked uh, optimistic. And, and this, is, this, is, this is sounding different here now, but you've, you've changed something. Why is it? Why is, it, why is it sharper in, in tonality and so? And he had just shifted the, some of the material into a different key. So, so it went up, he, and, uh, he transposed it a minor key, a minor second up. So, and all of a sudden, it was like the instrument locked in. Okay. And then, of course, so due to this, I had to rewrite plenty of stuff and, and rethink material, but it was worthwhile, and it was really, it's like on, an string, on a string instrument, if you ha use the open strings, they make the instrument right. sound, and the woodwind instruments, they have the similar things, there are certain fingerings for certain notes that, that have a bigger sound. So, so this, uh, this was a lesson for me to see where... The importance of the interpreter. Yeah. Interpreter of, um, so, last question, please. Um, we, you are going to finish the concert with uh, the Concerto for Orchestra by Vitol Lutoslavsky, uh, orchestra, uh, a huge orchestra um, piece from the 50s. Um, I read uh, also that uh, you dedicated our he died in 1994. Yeah. Uh, in that same year, you dedicated to him our, that is uh, also a major work. Um, do you recognize some kind of legacy on Butoslavsky's music for you? Or? He has been very important for me, and, and uh, I had the great opportunity to meet with him in the 1980s. He came quite often to Finland, and then also he was very involved with uh, the Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, my good friend uh, Esa-Pekka Salonen, who was um, the music director in Los Angeles, also was a great uh, fan, admirer of, of Lutoslavsky. So we spent, we spent quite some time together with him. And his music, before even that I got to know him, uh, had been very important for me because I think two major aspects of his music, I can honestly say, affected the way I've composed. One is his way of using harmonies, the way of working with 12-tone harmonies where the all, well, all pitches of, of the octave are part of the harmony. That, that world, for me, has always been very important. I grew up with a very dodecophonic and post-serial uh, 
world and uh, as a composer I feel uncomfortable if I don't know where I have all my pitches, so to say. <laughs> so I need, I've been thinking very much about harmonies with the, with the, 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 the chroma, the 12 tones all involved and how to make them more consonant and dissonant and all that you can do with that world. And Lutoslavsky taught me very many things in, in that respect. The other also very important aspect of his music is the sense of dramaturgy that he had and many of his major works like the String Quartet and the Second Symphony are based on this uh, hesitating direct music where he present he presents material somehow loose without the connection and then second half of the piece there is a connection and a reason why things are together this this uh, binary form so to say is very much him and and uh, I was so deeply affected by how effective it is and uh, while composing Aura in 93-94 I received the sad news that uh, he had he had died and uh, I was just in the very finishing state of, of making the piece and uh, the least I could do was to to write the piece in memoria of, of this uh, great major composer of the 20th century and it's a great uh, opportunity, luxury for me to, to uh, perform the concerto here. This piece was written in 1954 and it, uh, it became immediately the, the piece of, of Lutoslavsky and his yeah. whole legacy as a composer. Grow, grows with this piece. And historically what is interesting is when you think of the Bartok concerto, which the is from uh, yeah, 45, 54, so they are close to each other and yet, of course, Lutoslavsky had plenty of influence in his music from Bartok, but it's uh, definitely Lutoslavsky. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here and, uh, and we see you next Sunday.